fortunate to have an outstanding group of witnesses on our second panel. And uh, if you joined us, we're combining the first and the second panel. Uh, this is the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of Oversight and Government Reform. The topic for today is peeling back the TARP, exposing Treasury's failure to monitor the ways financial institutions are using taxpayer funds provided under the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Our first panel has been with uh, Mr. Neil Kashkari, and we're going to go to the uh, second panel. And uh, moving, moving right into this, I want to introduce the members of the panel. Uh, they include Professor Anthony B. Sanders, Professor of Finance and Real Estate at the W.P. Carey College of Business of Arizona State University, where he holds the Bob Herberger Arizona Heritage Chair. He's previously taught at the University of Chicago, the Graduate School of Business, University of Texas at Austin, Macomb School of Business, and the Ohio State University Fisher College of Business. In addition, he served as director and head of asset-backed and mortgage-backed securities research at Deutsche Bank in New York City. Mr. Stephen Horn is vice president of Master Data Management and Integration Services for Dow Jones Business and Relationship Intelligence. Mr. Horn has over 30 years' experience in master data management, consumer relationship management, web data applications, and very large database development. Mr. Horn specializes in large-scale data integration and data utilization from the Dow Jones Master Database and performs business development and strategy for these areas. Previously, Mr. Horn was a consultant for Generate, a startup relationship mapping and a web-based data collection firm that was acquired by Dow Jones to become the Dow Jones BRI division. Mr. Mark Boyano, is that, uh, is that the correct pronunciation? Va bene. Is president and CEO of XBRL US Incorporated, the leading advocate for the use of extensible business reporting language which promises to increase the transparency of reporting and disclosure of corporate financial information. Mr. Boyano joined XBRL US as its first president and CEO in December of 2006. Previously, he led the technology and online communications operations of the Council on Foundations as vice president and chief financial officer. We're also joined by Mr. Neil Borofsky. Mr. Borofsky was confirmed by the Senate as a Special Inspector General for the TARP on December uh, 8, 2008, and was sworn into office on December 15, 2008. Prior to assuming the position of Special Inspector General, Mr. Borofsky was a federal prosecutor in the United States Attorney's Office for Southern District of New York for more than eight years. In that office, Mr. Borofsky was a senior trial counsel who headed the Mortgage Fraud Group, which uh, investigated and prosecuted all aspects of mortgage fraud, from retail mortgage fraud cases to investigations involving potential securities fraud which res with respect to collateralized debt obligations. Mr. Borofsky received the Attorney, Gen the Attorney General's John Marshall Award for his work on the case that led to the conviction of former president of REFCO, Inc., and that's uh, Tony Grant and the guilty plea of Philip Bennett, uh, REFCO's former chief executive officer. Mr. Uh, Richard Hillman has served 31 years with the U.S. Government Accountability Office and is currently the managing director of the GAO's financial markets and community investment team. This team helps the Congress improve the efficiency of regulatory oversight in financial and housing markets and the management of community development programs. Over the past decade, Mr. Hillman has produced scores of reports and led a wide variety of efforts assessing the economy, efficiency, and effectiveness of federal and state regulation of financial services sector. It is the policy of the Committee of Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. Uh, I, I want to thank all of you for being here and I ask that now you would rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that each of the witnesses has answered in the affirmative. 
As with panel one and two, I ask that each witness give an oral summary of his or her testimony. And I would especially ask that you keep this summary under five minutes in duration. I would like you to bear in mind that your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. And uh, we're going to, um, uh, excuse me one minute. Uh, we're going to go from uh, my left to right. Uh, we're going to start with Professor Saunders. Uh, you have uh, five minutes, and I think we'll cover some of the territory in the Q&A. So you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, thank you for the invitation to testify before you today. I testified before you on November 14, 2008, on the subject of the Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP. At that time, we understood that the Treasury had not purchased any loans from the financial institutions using TARP funds. Instead, the TARP funds were deployed to numerous financial institutions. My testimony today focuses on the lack of transparency surrounding the use of the TARP funds and uh, as well as some related uh, Treasury and uh, Federal Reserve programs. Transparency is of critical importance to the stability of financial markets as well as the reputation of the U.S. and the international economy. For example, research has found that the frequency of stock market crashes is higher in countries with companies that are more opaque or less transparent to outside investors. A recent paper on asset mortgage securitization side <coughs> has concluded that in order to attract investors, transparency is essential. The less transparent a market is, the more poorly understood it will be by investors, and the higher will be the yield to those investors that to demand for the uh, compensate for the uncertainty. Thus, whether we are talking about loans that are originated and securitized by banks or how TARP funds are deployed to the banks, transparency is critical to returning trust to our financial system and comforting investors both U.S. and globally. When we consider that our own federal government borrows funds from overseas investors, Transparency would be a vital tool in restoring confidence in the tarnished financial system of the United States. Greater transparency of the TARP can alleviate concern amongst U.S. taxpayers about the, and, and the investment community that the funds are being used appropriately and not wasted. Without tra transparency, we are no longer the shining city on the hill. Rather, we are New York City during the blackout of 1977. For example, there should be more transparent asset valuation that we understand how Treasury and the Federal Reserve are valuing the banks relative to the private market valuations, that is the stock market. If the Treasury systematically is overvaluing the banks, it is an indication that we are still in danger from toxic assets, particularly mortgage, that have not been dealt with. Until asset valuation is more transparent and the market is confident that banks have written down toxic assets, such as bad mortgage loans, and accurately price these assets, any effort to restore stability and confidence in our financial system will ultimately fail. Now, one can argue that all assets, including TARP funds, are fungible, meaning that it is very difficult, if not impossible, to trace how TARP funds are spent. For example, if Bank A receives $15 billion in TARP funding, but is so large and complex that a paper trail cannot be followed, that presents serious problems. Despite our accounting and regulatory reporting on these institutions, the TARP funds seemingly sank into an abyss or a black coal. Clearly, greater transparency is required so that the TARP funds are spent in a non-wasteful manner. Now, currently, financial institutions report that uh, information that can be found in SEC filings, the 10Ks and Qs, and call reports that are produced quarterly. However, this information is not real time and is highly aggregated. As a consequence, it is difficult to follow the money from these filings. Although banks can report on the use of TARP funds in a timely fashion with Treasury, even daily, uh, the quality of these reports may be of dubious substance given the size and complexity of the financial institutions that have received TARP funds. For example, our largest financial institutions have hundreds of divisions and subsidiaries and perform operations in numerous countries. For example, Citigroup has operations in over 100 countries uh, and includes such banks as Bonamex. For regulatory body, Congress, the executive branch, and financial institutions themselves to understand where the TARP funds have gone, there is a need for more aggressive forms of auditing that prevent better disclosure. Traditional auditing of the financial institutions is a time-consuming and labor-intensive process. The Office of the Special Inspector General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, SIGTARP, produced an initial report to the U.S. Congress on February 6, 2009, detailing the allocation of TARP funds, which is an admirable first step in providing transparency for the TARP program, but it does not address how the recipients of the TARP funds have actually spent the money. 
an approach that can offer real-time measures of the expenditure of the TARP funds or any other uh, allocation of government funds as volumetrics. It is possible to obtain vast amount of reported information on loans, corporate benefits, golf tournaments, concerts, retreats, and aggregate them into a usable form for regulators and other market participants. Now, should the taxpayers be concerned about a particular bank using TARP funds for naming of a sports stadium? While it can be argued that naming of a sports stadium or a professional golf tournament is part of a marketing strategy, but it can also be argued that the price of, that the bank pays for these naming rights is far in excess of their advertising value. While it may be a reasonable argument to name sports stadiums, these institutions must be aware of the backlash by taxpayers and regulators against perceived squandering of scarce taxpayer dollars in an economic crisis. The same argument applies to rock concerts, corporate events, executive compensation, and perquisites. I'd, I'd like to ask the gentleman uh, if he could uh, try to wrap up uh, his testimony, and I know we'll get back to the Q&A. Transparency for these TARP fund recipients represents a step towards how we understand how tax dollars are deployed, particularly in an economic climate. In summary, the TARP should be wrapped in saran wrap rather than a lead veil that Superman can't even penetrate. Taxpayers have the right to know what to be done with their wealth, and transparency helps achieve more economically sound use of TARP funds and eliminate waste. Thank you for letting me share my thoughts with you. Uh, saran wrap. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Boyano. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. The I'm sorry. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. It's my privilege to testify today about XBRL, or Extensible Business Reporting Language. I am here as the president of a nonprofit organization, XBRL US, that advances XBRL as an open, free, open source standard. We all benefit from internet standards, and I'm not going to take any time to try to explain the concept. But just in the way that the web standard brought us browsers and global access and search to a huge amount of information, or PDF gave us high fidelity to the print document, or even emails made it possible for any of us to exchange messages, regardless of what software, what device, or even where we are. XBRL simply makes a common dictionary available and a consistent structure so that all financial reports can use a common format, so that it can be shared and exchanged at much lower cost with much lower time to do the processing. As we've heard for the last few hours, it is very labor and time intensive to analyze and parse financial reports. XBRL documents are more consistent, and they're searchable, and they're machine readable. And it can transform a 1,500-page 10K annual report that's nothing but a, a long stream of text into a structured index document that can be readily processed. But it's not the technology plumbing and wiring that's really the issue here. What's important about this standard and any standard is that the world chooses to agree on it. And the world has agreed on XBRL as the standard across the world for business reporting. I'd like to take just the next few minutes to elaborate on this and refer to my testimony in more detail to make the points that XBRL is real, it's ready, and it's relevant to the discussion of the subcommittee today. First of all, it's real. Every quarter, 8,000 banks report to the FDIC using this format, and they have since 2005. Um, I'll Re again, refer to the testimony on the, on the efficiencies of oversight and regulation gained by the <coughs> FDIC by using XBRL. A hundred companies today voluntarily file to the SEC their financial reports using XBRL. And over the next two years, SEC rules will phase in. All publicly traded companies will submit their financial reports, including the industrial, uh, industrial disclosures and footnotes that have numbers embedded in narrative text, like the pension footnote in XBRL, all, all mutual funds, uh, all credit ra rating agencies will be filing to the SEC phased in. These rules have just been promulgated and they'll be phased in over the next two years. So XBRL is real. It's in production. The dictionary that the SEC uses 
uh, developed by our nonprofit by bringing together um, lots of industries and professions for the common good, contains every concept in U.S. GAAP, generally accepted accounting practices. Uh, and we're building on that uh, in, to include, uh, as uh, detailed in the testimony, mortgage-backed securities. This, this is uh, ready for use in the, and it's being applied right now in our uh, market. It's also ready in terms of having a strong organizational underpinnings. Our nonprofit is, uh, brings together the accounting industries, the CFOs that issue, all the way to the investors and the, everyone in between, including technology companies, for the common good to make sure that we get a high quality agreement uh, between industry and government to, uh, to publish out these dictionaries. And finally, I'm going to say it's relevant in that um, again and again uh, we heard today about we're not sure, we can't see, we don't know. The fact is you can't provide oversight to something you can't see. And this common standard does offer a powerful tool for the government and for markets to get true visibility and transparency into the facts, into the books. With that, I'll uh, conclude my remarks. And I, again, I thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just end with, with the one point that um, transparency is no longer a matter of technical capability. It's a decision that's waiting to be made. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, subcommittee. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Boyano. Uh, Mr. Horn, you may proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Jordan, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Steve Horn, and I want to thank you for inviting us here to speak to you today. I'm going to show you an example of what uh, Professor Sanders and Mr. Bolgiano were just speaking of. Um, and the question is getting to uh, TARP transparency, and I've got uh, some slides up on the uh, board. You may not be able to see them too well. Those who have the handouts have the slides included. Um, the question you've raised is where did the money go? Um, and I think that's the question everybody's been asking since this, this morning started. Um, I'm going to show you how to take what is complex financial information and make it simple and then transparent. And I'm showing on the slide here eight of the CPP institutions. I, I intentionally left off AIG because being an SFFI, SSFI, they have different things that we have to look at and we can talk about those at another time if you wish. Um, but these companies collectively received uh, just about 200 billion of the total TARP outlay from Tranche 1. Um, they collectively represent over $10 trillion in assets. They have greater than 14,000 subsidiaries, any of which could receive funds that have been infused into the institutions themselves. They have greater than 6,000 executives making decisions as to how to use these corporate assets. And in the first 100 days since TARP funds were approved, there has been greater than 40,000 what we call public events, which consist of regulatory filings, press releases and other kinds of public disclosure about these firms regarding TARP, specifically TARP. Now, let's look at an institution to illustrate the complexity, okay? I don't expect anybody to read this art eye chart, okay? Rather, I'm making a point of the structural complexity, in this case of just Bank of America. And, and I chose Bank of America because they were alphabetical. So there's any other institution is going to kind of look this way. Um, this is a portion, and only a portion, of B of A's 2,435 subsidiaries and divisions. Uh, the reporting banks on the slide are shown in red. The investment firms are shown in blue. Any of these subsidiaries and divisions may be a beneficiary of the funds that were part of the total $45 billion in total capital infusions that have come into this institution through TARP. Uh, to Bank of America. 104 of these subsidiaries and divisions file with up to 20 or more government agencies, and there's no single holistic view of the institution that come in through those agencies. Furthermore, the information sometimes come in disparate and incompatible formats. And my friend here, Mr. Bolgiano, has commented on the fact that we are very big subscribers to the concept of XBRL um, because that is a compatible and uh, consistent format. In other cases, it's aggregated at the holding company level, but you lose all the detail of the transactions that are underneath it. Okay? Now, a lens can be put on individual transactions that roll the data into a single view of the institution. 
okay? Now, in the timeline that's shown on my chart here, um, you, instead of looking at greater than 10,000 of Bank of America events, a regulator could highlight what they might call the seminal events chosen by them, which show the key transactions of the funds that move through the institution. In addition, the aggregation of the non-public regulatory data as proposed under Congresswoman Maloney's bill, uh, TARP Accountability and Disclosure Act, would be available to the regulator as well. At the request of the committee, we have a sample of transactions that are in excess of $1 billion, as well as charitable contributions and marketing events during this first 100-day period. The first capital infusion at the beginning of the chart took place on October 28th of last year, and $15 billion were taken onto the Bank of America books as a partial receivable. The remaining $10 billion was paid out when the Merrill Lynch transaction was completed. Other events, including the issuance of new debt, to layoffs, to charitable contributions, continue to impact the balance sheet as highlighted in this timeline. So let's drill into one of these events, okay? Just last week, the Bank of America filed their 10K SEC annual report for 2008. Now, here on the right side of the chart, um, what you're going to see is a statement about their new Q4 lending activity. And other institutions have made similar types of statements. Now, to use an analogy, think of your own checking account. You know your balance. You just can't look at the deposits. You have to look at the withdrawals, too. So to add transparency, must, one must look at the offsetting activity shown in the summary, including write-downs, foreclosures, toxic asset reductions, etc., to get to the balance as you would in your own checking account. You might question, you know, the lending activity is occurring between the banking institutions and federally sanctioned lending institutions such as Freddie Mae, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, FHA, etc. So none of this is contained within the filings themselves. Now compare the single institution to looking at three separate and aggregated view of three separate institutions, in this case, uh, Bank of America, Citigroup, and J.P. Morgan Chase. These banks were recipients of more than 75 billions during the Q4 period of 2008 of TARP funds that were reported increased lending activity. Similar offsets took place with these institutions as well. What we see here is 75 billion in capital fusions and less than 100 billion, or 100 million rather, in increased net credit facilities to the American people. Now that's what's on the balance sheet. What's off the balance sheet is another thing entirely, but that means it's not transparent. How do we reconcile the overall lending activity from the institutions that are reporting to the federal government? Public data plus the addition of the data including Congresswoman Maloney's bill will enable the ultimate provider of information to go from a complex collection of separate transactions across thousands of organizations to greater transparencies of funds distributed to the government to private institutions. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Jordan, members of the committee for your time and attention. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about here, and uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. Uh, Mr. Borofsky, uh, Special Inspector General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Jordan, members of the subcommittee, I'm honored to appear before you today as the Special Inspector General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or as we call it, SIGTARP. Um, $300 billion has already gone out the door, and including the recently announced programs, Treasury intends to combine TARP funds with the Federal Reserve and others to more than quadruple the original $700 billion allotment to fund at least eight separate programs involving approximately $2.9 trillion. These huge investments of taxpayer money will vary vary in abuse and will require strict oversight. To meet this oversight challenge, I have focused SIGTARP on three areas since our inception. Enforcement, transparency, and oversight. First, enforcement. Of the four primary bodies set forth in the Stabilization Act, we alone are responsible for investigating those who seek to criminally profit from the TARP. To meet this challenge, we have developed key relationships with other law enforcement and prosecutorial agencies from coast to coast and have already shut down one securities fraud in Tennessee and of several other criminal investigations pending. Today, I'm also pleased to announce our newly formed TALF Task Force. The TALF has been announced as a trillion dollar Federal Reserve Bank of New York um, program that will be seeded with up to $100 billion in TARP money. It is intended to restore liquidity into the securitization market by lending government money to investors, including hedge funds, to buy newly issued asset-backed securities. We have been vocal in our warnings about the susceptibility of this program to fraud, and today we convert those warnings into action by putting together a team of federal law enforcement and regulatory investigators to address potential fraud in the TALF. Members of this task force will include the SEC, the FBI, the Postal Inspection Service, ICE, Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, the Fed Federal Reserve's 
Inspector General, and the IRS. We will operate out of New York and Washington and will provide training to both federal and local law enforcement and prosecutorial agencies and provide a conduit so we can ensure a quick response to any tip or lead, whether generated from our hotline, 877-SIG-2009, the Federal Reserve, or elsewhere. Together, the members of our task force will combine our shared experience in securities fraud investigations and combine our resources to identify and cut off potential fraud schemes before they can fully develop, deter would-be criminals, and bring to justice those who seek to commit fraud through the TALF. For any would-be fraudster, our message is clear. If you try and steal from this program, we will fine you, we will investigate you, and we will put you in jail. My office has also focused on transparency since my first day in the office. And our audits are going to bring transparency both to those running the TARP program and the TARP recipients. We are conducting a survey of the TARP's recipients' use of funds and on both the recipients' plans for complying with executive compensation conditions as well as Treasury's plans on overseeing compliance. We are also conducting audits on the impact of outside influences such as lobbyists on the TARP application process and a case study on the circumstances under which Bank of America received approval for $45 billion in cash, $100 billion in asset guarantee in four different transactions through three separate TARP programs. As for oversight, we have and will continue to coordinate our oversight activities with my co-panelist, Rick Hillman, and his colleagues at GAO, as well as with the other inspectors general whose responsibilities touch on the TARP. We have also tried to have a positive impact on TARP programs before the money goes out the door. Treasury has adopted several of our recommendations and we will continue to make recommendations to Treasury to address potential fraud as the new programs are rolled out. The TARP program has changed significantly since the Stabilization Act was passed last October. Originally intended to purchase and manage $700 billion of toxic assets, that effort now stands as just a portion of only one of the eight intended TARP programs and less than 25 percent of the total $2.9 trillion involved. We must change with it. And I ask that you support S-383, the Special Inspector General Act of 2009, which unanimously passed the Senate early last month and would give my office important hiring flexibility to react as the TARP programs grow and evolve. Quick passage of this important and essential legislation will help me continue to build the necessary core of my office to meet this challenge. Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Jordan, members of the committee, I commend you for your efforts to ensure proper oversight of the trillions of dollars of American taxpayer funds, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Borofsky. Uh, Mr. Hillman is the uh, person who is the Managing Director of Financial Markets and Community Investment for the United States Government Accountability Office. Thank you for being here. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss our work on the Troubled Assets Relief Program. My statement today is primarily based on our second 60-day report required under ESA that was issued on January 30, 2009. Specifically, my statement focuses on the nature and purpose of activities that have been initiated under TARP and Treasury's efforts to establish a management structure for TARP. Regarding our first objective, Treasury has announced a number of new programs to try to stabilize financial markets, but most of its activities during our reporting period have continued to fall under its capital purchase program. As of March 5, 2009, Treasury has dispersed approximately $300 billion in TARP funds, about $200 billion of which was for the capital purchase program. Our previous report emphasized the lack of monitoring and reporting for program investments and recommended stronger measures to ensure that participating institutions use the funds to meet the program's purpose and comply with program requirements on, for example, executive compensation and dividend payments. In response to our recommendation, Treasury developed plans to survey the largest 20 institutions monthly to monitor lending and other activity and analyze quarterly call report data for all institutions. While the monthly survey is a step toward greater transparency and accountability for the largest institutions, we continue to believe that additional action is needed to better ensure that all participating institutions are accountable for their use of program funds. Our latest report recommended that Treasury expand the scope of its monthly surveys to include collecting at least some information from all institutions participating in the program. Further, our most recent report found that Treasury has made limited progress in articulating and communicating an overall strategy for TARP. 
This lack of a clearly articulated vision has complicated Treasury's ability to effectively communicate with Congress, the financial markets, and the public on the benefits of TARP and has limited its ability to identify personnel needs. While Treasury has continued to publicly report on individual issues, testify, and make speeches about the program, it continues to struggle to convey a clearly articulated and overarching message about its efforts potentially hampering TARP's effect effectiveness and underscoring ongoing questions about its communication strategy. Without a clearly articulated strategic vision, Treasury's effectiveness in helping to stabilize markets may be hampered. Our most recent report recommended that Treasury clearly articulate its vision for TARP and to document needed skills and competencies to achieve that vision. Regarding our second objective on TARP's efforts to establish a management structure for TARP, our first report included several recommendations for Treasury to improve hiring, contract oversight, and its system of internal controls. Treasury has taken important steps to address our recommendations, but in its latest report, we found that it still faces several challenges. First, it took proactive steps to ensure a smooth transition to the new administration by keeping positions filled and using an expedited hiring process, including direct hire authority. Moreover, after losing some potential candidates because of conflicts of interest, Treasury is now asking candidates to address potential conflicts earlier in the recruitment process to avoid unnecessary delays in finalizing employment offers. However, it continues to face difficulty providing competitive salaries to attract skilled employees. Second, consistent with our earlier report about contracting oversight, Treasury has enhanced such oversight by tracking cost, schedule, and performance, and addressing its training requirements of personnel who oversee the contracts. However, as we previously recommended, Treasury needs to continue to identify and mitigate conflicts of interest in contracting. Similarly, in an earlier recommendation, our latest report found that a framework for adopting and organizing the development and implementation of a system for internal controls for TARP activities is progressing. The plan, the program plans to use this framework to develop specific standards, policies, drive communications on expectations, and measure effectiveness of internal controls and, pol and their related policies and procedures. However, to date, much work continues to be needed to be accomplished in this area, including implementing a disciplined risk assessment process. Our latest report called for the development of a comprehensive system of internal controls over TARP activities, including detailed policies and procedures and guidance that are robust enough to ensure that the program's objectives and requirements are being met. In summary, Treasury is taking important steps to implement our previous recommendations, but we continue to identify a number of areas that warrant ongoing action by Treasury to improve the accountability and integrity of the program. Mr. Chairman and Mr. Subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss these critically important issues and be happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Hellman. I'd like to go to questions now and begin with Mr. Horn. In your testimony, you made the pretty shocking statement that the new lending uh, several of the largest TARP recipients have claimed they're doing has been grossly overstated. Uh, I'm going uh, to ask staff to uh, help us with some of these uh, Bank of America slides. How could their representations be so far at odds with your own? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't believe that the representations per se are at odds. What they are are uh, one side of the story. Um, you well, have you're just looking at new credit, but not offset by credit contracted. If you're going to publish a story that says that you're giving uh, 115 billion or whatever, uh, 150 billion in case of another institution, et cetera, that talks about new lending activities, um, the balance sheet would actually say to you that you should also show the opposite side of those transactions. Um, that has not been what we have observed. Um, and again, so we don't really have a clear view as to the net effect. Transparency would would dictate that you would want both sides of the of so the. You, so you could have a condition where a lot of money is going out the door, but the credit contracts and you have a net loss. Well, again, as I'm said, we're trying to represent information from a transparency I, I know you, standpoint. Right. 
So, so our issue is, from a transparency perspective, if you want to be transparent, um, and we've been doing so for 100 years for the commercial marketplace, um, you have to show both sides of the, of the picture. Okay. And it's impossible for you to say that you're giving out lending without having an offsetting amount that shows what you're retracting. Thank you, Mr. Horn. I want to ask Professor Sanders, from the standpoint of impact on the economy, which is a more accurate description of bank lending activities? The method of representation employed by several TARP recipients or the method that Mr. Horn has presented? Well, I think the method Mr. Horn is presenting gives us a much better picture of how it's really impacting our economy and how it's impacting borrowers. Because, again, the, the way the, the bank balance sheets are structured and the call reports, we just can't get a good picture. Uh, what Mr. Horn is talking about is much more in real time and is much more uh, translucent. We can actually see what's going on. So let's go back to Mr. Horn. If the banks you've identified are creating so little new credit now that they have billions in TARP funds, what are they using TARP funds for? Well, again, m most of the activity that we're seeing from a transparency perspective are reflected in the balance sheet. So if you looked along the timeline of some of the, the examples of events, you can see some of the examples of events. The first transaction that took place in the case of the Bank of America event was a $16.8 billion debt buy-down on countrywide uh, being infused into Bank of America. Now, at that point in time, they only received $15 billion, so they used some of their internal funds. They also, many of the institutions need money to make money. In other words, you can't go out and make, lend secured notes or create senior debt without having balances or, or, or relatively large sums in reserves. So they want to keep this money on their books in some cases in order to be able to try to get other institutions to invest in them. Well, can they get a true picture, a treasury uh, a bank lending by relying on the monthly intermediation? No, you snapshot? cannot. You need to have every, every individual event that occurs transactionally um, over time brought together into a single format and structure so, to answer that question. So all the necessary information is available to regulators to create transparency of how TARP funds are being used? All the necessary information is available in 25 or some odd different places. Mr. In Boyano, uh, Treasury can track how banks are, are using these funds? Yes. And the technical capability is there, is that right? Yes. That's correct. So it comes to the question of whether there's a will to do it? That's right. Uh, some have argued that since TARP funds are fungible, is it not possible to track the use of TARP funds? I mean, Mr. Horn? Um, it's absolutely possible. Uh, Professor Sanders uh, mentioned volumetrics. Um, volumetrics is if you think of two glasses of water, and if you were to pour the water, they were both half full, and you pour the water out of one glass, and as long as you don't spill any into another glass, um, you should have the same volume of water. If you look at individual events, and remember there's a Pareto principle, I don't know how many are familiar with the 80-20 Pareto law, law. Well, in these cases of the institutions that we're talking about here, it's more like 95-5, where 5 percent of the transactions make up 95 percent of the actual movement of funds. So there's not, as a proportion of number of transactions, a large number volumetrically of funds that have to be looked at in order to understand the ebbs and flows of the funds moving throughout the business. Okay? It is complex in terms of the interconnections, and that's why it's so important to have a format such as XBRL, which would leave the ability to take two different systems together that are speaking totally different languages and bring them together as one. Thank you, uh, Mr. Horn. Uh, uh, my uh, time has concluded uh, this round. Mr. Jordan, you may proceed for Thank five you, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is, is it fair to say then, uh, I'm, I'm trying to gather this together, that it's almost too much information in too many different forms is actually leading to a lack of transparency. Is that the problem? And we'll go with Mr. Horn again. Um, yes, Ranking Mem Member Jordan. Uh, in some cases that is true, but I feel that it's mostly a lack of the ability for individual members of various committees, of the regulatory agencies, et cetera, to read paper documents. We live in Washington in a document-based world. We don't okay. live in a data world. Is, has there been a reluctance on the part of uh, various financial institutions and, uh, and or the Treasury to embrace Mr. Boyano's um, uh, XBRL that he talked about or, or, or the, the process that's going to allow us to sort of synthesize this and, and get it in a readable form. Has there been a reluctance out there to go that direction? Well, I would defer that to Mr. Boyano right. relative to his. Well, 
uh, in our markets today, there's. Uh, and if there's been a reluctance, give me your why. Why, I, why is I that the case? I think there is certainly a reluctance, first of all, to change in general. But also, uh, information is a very valuable commodity, and the absence of a standard and the absence of transparency makes the processing and the publishing of that information a very profitable enterprise. Valuable, sure. This is, this is a commodity right. that flows through our, our economy just like any other. Um, so that the absence of transparency does protect certain businesses. Mr. Uh, I want to go to, to the to the Inspector General, Mr. Brofsky. Your thoughts on the same question? We obviously we've initiated we've taken a different approach to this. We made a recommendation to Treasury that they require banks to um, establish internal controls to account for their use of funds and report on the use of funds. We recommended that they do that on a forward going basis. They haven't, so we've initiated our own use of fund survey. And we've polled all of the banks. And wait, wait, go, go back. I'm, I'm going to just reset that you made a recommendation to Treasury to, to, to increase transparency and they didn't? Yes, it's included in our, our February 6th report. We made a okay. recommendation that for every agreement going forward, um, just taking a step back, we initially made the recommendation back in late December. And they did adopt it with respect to Bank America and Citigroup in those, the, those extraordinary transactions. They did require those banks to establish internal controls at our recommendation and to report quarterly on how they're using the funds. They've not adopted that recommendation with respect to any other financial institutions. And, and give me your uh, guess as to why. I don't want to. I don't want to hazard a guess. Um, I think that Mr. Kashkari had has articulated some things this morning that are probably consistent with that explanation. I don't want to speak for him, mm -hmm. but concern about putting certain conditions on Well, I mean, that's an, obviously that's an important question, particularly when, uh, in your written testimony, you talk about the potential exposure of hundreds of billions of dollars in taxpayer money uh, potentially being lost to fraud, and that's in your written testimony. So that's an important question. It's absolutely an important question. And, and um, talk about the relation, your thoughts on the XBRL, the, 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 that, that concept as well. Well, we have, which, from our perspective, we're, we're taking a look and we're doing the survey of all the financial institutions' use of funds, and we're going to mm -hmm. get their, their narratives. Uh, they're coming in. I think we have about 90 percent responded. I think XBRL would help us turn around and then test some of these responses, but we're taking a different approach really on starting with the financial institutions' own reporting on how they're using the funds. Now, our reports also require certification uh, subject to criminal penalty that if they lie to us, they'd be committing a crime and we would investigate that. So we're hoping that provides a sufficient hammer to make sure we get accurate responses. It, it, it's usually a pretty good incentive. Uh, l last question, uh, XBRL, can this help us, and my, my guess is it can, um, get to the questions I posed earlier to Mr. Kashkari that, you know, we still haven't got at the, the, the focus of this entire TARP program initially, the mortgage-backed securities. Can it help us in that regard as well? Yes, we've been, uh, yes. Mr. Jordan, we've been working on uh, the mortgage-backed securities dictionary for the last six months with this, with this question in mind. Uh, it's not a substitute for policy, obviously, and it's not a substitute for access to the information uh, or the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the government authority to request that information. But it does give a consistent vehicle mm -hmm. for that information to be delivered and for the government to use it effectively. Thank you, Chairman. I thank the gentleman, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. The, uh, Mr. Broski, you mentioned the, I think you were talking about the task force. Um, and then you just talked a moment ago about um, if folks lie to you. What kind of, uh, how, do you, how do you deal with that? And what is the, what, what's the offense? Well, any, any lie, any, any official, senior executive officer, any person who lies to us, we're a government entity, we're part of the executive branch, that's a crime under 18 U.S.C. 1001. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the statute that Martha Stewart, for example, was prosecuted under, just to give it a, an easy example. Uh -huh. uh, and we require each and every one of our, the recipients of our survey to sign a certification with the senior executive officer um, stating that the information that's contained in this report are true, and if they lie, that is, a, that is a federal crime. Uh, do you, when we try to get information from some of these folks, um, they seem to duck and dodge, and we don't always get 
the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And I'm just wondering, um, do you feel that you're getting the kind of information that you need? My, my audit chief, who's begun the review of these, these surveys, we're, we're holding off doing our, our full review until they're all in, which is, should be this week, um, has told me that the initial, his initial review, that they've been very good responses. Uh, we've gotten a lot of detailed responses about use of funds, according to him. He thinks that he's encouraged that we're going to be able to do um, a very complete audit report. Uh, we'll have to take a look at that. And then obviously there's going to be follow-up. Uh, we're not just going to take the banks at their word. Uh, we're going to be doing follow-up as part of the audit process. Now, are you, are you staffed uh, up to uh, sufficiently? No. Um, we are, we're growing. We've been in existence a little bit under three months now. Um, we have about 25 people on staff. Um, we, are try we are aggressively hiring. It's been very difficult. Uh, the S383, uh, which is now in the House, uh, will help us grow. It, it gives us some hiring flexibility that we, that we desperately need. Uh, we're, we're striving to build towards about um, 100 to 125 initially. Um, so hiring is a challenge. Um, but I also don't want to leave the impression that it is only me and, and my staff of 25 standing between the taxpayers, uh, $2.9 trillion, and those who would try to take advantage of it. We're working with, with all of federal law enforcement, as well as some state law enforcement, uh, to make sure that we have the right protections in place. I see we have a vote coming, but I have a one, one question I've got to get out. Um, in your written testimony, you indicate, and I quote, that uh, you have begun an audit into the process under which the Bank of America received $45 billion in capital investment and is to receive a guarantee relating to approximately uh, $100 billion of toxic assets in four separate top, top transactions under three different top programs. You further state, and this is what I'm getting to, as to coordinated oversight, it has, it has been and will continue. Now, considering what you wrote in your testimony, um, I'm interested to know whether the Treasury knew about the $3.6 billion in bonuses awarded by Merrill Lynch in December just before it was taken over by Bank of America. Did you know about that? Um, Congressman, I really can't talk about any matters that are, that are pending under review in our investigations. Uh, we, ha we have, it has been stated that we do have a pending investigation into the Merrill Lynch B of A bonus situation. I understand. Uh, well, let me ask you another way. Um, ask you, and and you, this may fall in the same category. Is that the kind? Is this the kind of information, though, that would normally come through your office? Yes, Congressman. We would we would ask those types of questions, and we would expect to receive those types right. of answers. And you would expect to have get truthful answers. Is that right? It would also be a crime to lie to our office if we asked that question. If somebody gave an untruthful answer, that would also be a crime. So yes, we would expect truthful Very answers. Well. Uh, I, I know that we've got a vote coming up, so I will. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll go to uh, uh, Mr. We'll go to Mr. Iser. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to try and focus a little bit of attention again on XBRL, and I apologize. I've been going between here and uh, the Circuit City bankruptcy hearing next door. Uh, <clears throat> And, uh, and actually, they have a lot in common since it cost Circuit City $30 million to get a $50 million dip financing package. Needless to say, their Chapter 11 was uh, short. Uh, but uh, without getting into whether TARP funds should be used for dip financing or encourage a debtor in possession financing to stop corporations from going bankrupt completely, uh, Mr. Horn, uh, Mr. Uh, Bolgano, let me, let me t go towards you again. I think uh, I heard uh, Mr. Uh, Jordan kind of get on this, but I want to be absolutely sure. If XBRL were to be implemented going forward, well, let's go the other way. If, in fact, we were to use XBRL to try to drill down into where the TARP money has gone today, would you be able to do that? Yes, sir. With the uh, proper authority from the government, we would be able to provide the tool to be wielded by the government for oversight. So you could provide the tool. They would need to make sure they had access to the, the, the well, divergent we would, databases. We would, we would be uh, able to provide the standard 
uh, to be wielded as a tool, a dictionary, but it's not a system, it's not software. Sure, we realize that it's you, a, you allow standard. other people to develop independently it's, software that use your right. technology. It's, <laughs> it's similar, if you had asked me in 1993, would it make it easier to get information from people if we had the web? I would immediately answer you yes. It would be a quantum leap in the efficiency, time, and expense okay, to then, gather information. Right. So I guess, Mr. Horn, would you have the equivalent of Google now that we've established that it's like getting the web? Uh, would you have the ability to drill down? Well, I would love to be using that analogy. Um, um, I think that the key is is that we would actually create something that would be, act, to a greater extent, even more actionable relative to this subject matter because we would be dealing with the numbers of events that are specifically related to the financial instances that would be involved. So the answer to that, Mr. Congressman, is yes, we would, we would be in that type of position. And then I think I'll, I'll shift. Uh, obviously, if we implemented this technology going forward, it wouldn't just be the two of you we'd be asking, but in fact, all our regulators would then have the tools to do this themselves. That is correct. And it would also be on the basis of um, the fact that we're asking through uh, Congresswoman Maloney and, and Congressman King um, and also in, in the Senate to uh, pass a bill that would allow access to the regulated data so it wouldn't just be the data that's publicly available but also the data that would be available only to those people who would have access for regulatory purposes. Okay. And then, Mr. Bolofsky, uh, when I when we had Mr. Kashkari, or Secretary Kashkari here a few minutes ago, uh, he answered in very, very many ways that, of course, he would love to have the ability to have more transparency, to, to know the value of these assets in order to value them and so on. But today, are we in fact, as I, I'm going to lead a little bit here, are we in fact asking for repeatedly, and are you asking for repeatedly, production of documents almost in the way that attorneys do in a court case, where you have to know what you want, you ask for it, they turn it over to you, often you have to sift through it and say, but it's not in a format I can use, uh, can you, can you re-manipulate it and send it back to us? Is that pretty much what's going on in the delivery of uh, answers to your questions by the various TARP recipients? Um. No, Congressman. I, from what my audit chief tells me, we've gotten uh, good narrative answers that we think are going to be very useful. We, we, I, I was talking about production of data, not narrative answers. Well, we have Bank of no, in, in fairness, Bank of America said they were solvent, so solvent that they could turn around and buy Merrill Lynch. Today we know that that's not true. That in fact we'd have been much better off having Merrill Lynch live or die on its own, B of A live or die on its own, and not have two organizations perhaps too big to fail be now two organizations made into one too, too, too big to fail. So back to the question. You're receiving answers to your request, narrative answers. Uh, Mr. Kashkari, of course, if he asked for it, is receiving them. But the real question, the question that Mr. Horn was asked and answered was, do you, know, do you or does anyone in the federal government have the ability to basically ask the question if they have the access and get the answers from raw data, uh, diverse raw data? Or do we, in fact, depend on often self-serving individuals at various large banks who do not want to fail to give us answers that cause us to give them money only to later get answers that they need more money? Uh, you can ask. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired, but please answer the question. We have not asked for that type of raw data in, in part because it would be simply way too expensive for us to analyze it. So you, uh, if I can conclude, so you don't ask for the information because you couldn't analyze it. People are here today talking about the tools to analyze it both prospectively and, ret and retrospectively, and we, we're, we're being told, no, we're going to rely on companies to deliver us information you know, that the, have proven to be unreliable. The gentleman makes a point, if I may, and, sure. and that is, uh, Mr. Borofsky, how do you know if people are telling the truth if you don't have a com comprehensive database against which to analyze the bank's reports? What, what we're doing in our survey and how we're going to test these answers is, is there are several things that we've built into the survey. And it is a survey, Let's, to be very clear. We are initially, as the initial part of this audit and is a part one, relying on the bank's responses, but not, not in a vacuum. For example, we've asked them to make reference to their budgets and plans. You know, our, our experience is that when a bank gets a huge influx of cash, they don't just say, you know, have, have a party and start doing it. They budget. They plan for it. These TARP programs are expensive for some of these banks. Well, um, so actually, we AIG make, did have a party, if I remember uh, right. They did. They, they, they <laughs> may have, but 
uh, and this, many uh, of these financial institutions. They have a plans. They have budgets. We make reference to internal emails, internal planning, and we're going to test it against that. And again, if they do lie, if they do tell us a story, uh, and it doesn't match up with their internal documents, with their public statements, with with data that we can later obtain, they'll have committed a crime, and we're going to investigate that thoroughly. And this, uh, and and if I may say that this investigative party will continue. Uh, we have dozens, literally dozens of questions to ask the witnesses, but we're out of time. Uh, we're going to submit written questions as a follow-up to the witnesses, and I'll ask Mr. Issa and uh, Mr. Jordan to join me in this, uh, that will help to uh, fulfill the purpose of this particular meeting. Now, we have had uh, uh, a very patient panel here in front of us because this hearing has gone on over five hours. Uh, this, the title of the hearing, Peeling Back the Tarp, Exposing Treasury's Failure to Monitor the Ways Financial Institutions Are Using Taxpayer Funds Provided Under the Troubled Assets Relief Program. We know that we could be looking at as much as $3 trillion in funds that are coming uh, from our government, from the taxpayers, to these various Wall Street interests. It is a mind-boggling amount of money. And we also know that if Treasury does not have the capability to keep track of those funds, we're looking at a nightmare. And we're looking at, at a severe challenge to trust in the political system. We can worry about banks collapsing, but we also better worry about the trust that the American people should have in their government collapsing because that is the basis for our entire nation. It's all held together by trust. So I want to thank each of the witnesses for what they have done to try to take a path towards trust and towards accountability and towards reliability of the information which Congress has given. I want to thank you on behalf of this committee and on behalf of the American people. Uh, this uh, uh, committee meeting stands adjourned. Uh, but we will be back at this subject. I want uh, everyone here who is uh, paying attention to this to know this subcommittee will not relent in our uh, efforts to make sure that the people of the United States know how the, their tax dollars are being spent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you.